Good morning, everyone. My name is Roshan Prashant. I am a fourth year honors student enrolled in the Bachelor of Philosophy program, and this is my research project. It is the extraction of radiomics features before and after treatment from fed pet images obtained uh, for patients who were diagnosed with glioblastoma multiforme. Uh, my supervisor is Dr. Martin Ebert, and uh, I would also like to thank Nathaniel Barry, whose master's thesis laid the foundation for my research project this year. Uh, today, I intend to provide you with a brief summary of the current literature regarding the subject. Uh, I also wish to uh, discuss the aims of my research, as well as my research plan and the progress that I've made thus far. So the uh, first uh, topic of discussion is what exactly is glioblastoma multiforme? Uh, it is a grade four tumor of the central nervous system. Uh, it is the most common of the malignant central nervous system tumors and brain tumors, accounting for approximately 50% of the cases. Uh, there are two predominant forms, the IDH wild type, which is 20% of cases, and IDH mutant, which accounts for the remaining 80%. Uh, wild type glioblastoma arises spontaneously and has a higher mortality, whereas the IDH mutant uh, arises from a previous astrocytoma. Uh, astrocytoma is a cancer of glial cells known as astrocytes. Approximately 1% of cases are associated with Lynch and Lee Fraumeni syndromes, which are uh, syndromes that result in a patient being more susceptible to cancers in general. Uh, the peak age of incidence for GBM is 45 to 55 years of age, and the main median age of incidence is 64. Uh, the mortality for patients diagnosed with GBM is quite high, uh, with the median survival being only 9 to 12 months and the average five-year survival being 5.4%. Uh, and this mortality seems to be associated with the unique biology of the brain. Uh, the tumor lethality is increased in the brain due to mass effect alongside a, the risk of a stroke due to a local hemorrhage. A local hemorrhage may arise when a tumor outgrows its vasculature. Uh, mass effect usually, usually precedes metastasis, and this is owing to the slower rate of spread of tumors in the central nervous system relative to cancers in other areas of the body. The cranial cavity is a well-defined and enclosed space, and this is due to the presence of the skull as well as dural membranes, as can be seen in this image where this is the skull and these are the dural membranes, and uh, this results in the cranial cavity being quite a uh, closed off space from the uh, rest of the body. And as a result, the skull is relatively inflexible to changes in intracerebral contents. Uh, hence, if there is a tumor in the brain, it increases the intracranial pressure uh, under uh, under a set of rules uh, known as the Monroe Kelly Doctrine, a raised intracranial pressure compromises cerebral blood flow, cerebral spinal fluid flow, and the cerebral tissue itself. Uh, under what's called parenchymal displacement, uh, the gyri of the brain, which is the ripples that are observed in, on the outside of the brain, uh, they can become compressed. And as seen in this image in the bottom left, the midline, as represented by this red line, uh, can be uh, shifted, and in this case, it's been shifted to the right. And furthermore, these structures here in the brain are known as the lateral ventricles. And as it can be seen, the one on the left side has been uh, compromised, and this is known as effacement of the ventricles. Uh, these ventricles containing uh, sp cerebrospinal fluid, which is important for cushioning of the brain as well as holding some nutrients. Uh, another potential consequence of parenchymal displacement is herniation of the brain, uh, either into physiological spaces or pathological spaces. Uh, a herniation of the brain into pathological spaces can be immediately fatal, especially in situations where the uh, brain herniates into the spinal cord. Uh, and so this is actually something that is unique to this particular environment, uh, because usually cancers are not immediately fatal. However, in the brain, they can be, and this is because of the risk of stroke due to the hemorrhage, as well as due to herniation. And this is on top of the uh, complications that can arise from uh, parenchymal displacement, which can cause motor and sensory dysfunction. So this really highlights the importance of having an effective method of diagnosing glioblastoma. Uh, factors that are associated with better prognosis are early, de early detection of the cancer, as well as an accurate mapping of the tumor's genotypic and phenotypic, also known as physical features. These physical features are important in order to have a an effective surgical resection, as well as for radiotherapeutic removal. The current diagnostic gold standard for glioblastoma is MRIs, 
and this involves the intravenous administration of gadolinium, which accumulates in regions that have an increased angiogenesis, forming a ring-enhancing lesion. Angiogenesis is one of the key steps outlined by uh, the Knudsen hypothesis, which lays out 10 key steps that a neoplastic lesion has to follow in order to become a malignant cancer. And angiogenesis is one of the key uh, steps in, uh, outlined by this Knudsen hypothesis. The characteristics of glioblastoma on an MRI are central necrosis, as well as a strong contrast enhancement. Uh, as can be seen in this image, this is the outline of the tumor, which is quite clear. And this is what, uh, and this is where there is an increased angiogenesis. And this angiogenesis uh, process is associated with pathological changes in the brain, specifically a disruption in aquaporin function in the blood-brain barrier. Uh, aquaporins are proteins that uh, allow for the passage of water and small solutes across membranes. Uh, as a result of this aquaporin dis uh, disruption, the blood-brain barrier is unable to perform its physiological functionalities, such as the delivery of nutrients, as well as protecting the brain from toxic substances and removing toxic substances from the region of the brain. Other forms of MRI may also be integrated in the diagnostic process, uh, such as MRI spectroscopy. Uh, this determines the chemical composition of the tumor by comparing ratios of compounds that are found in normal brain tissue with those that are abundant exclusively in tumors. An example of this is the ratio of N-acetyl aspartate to the ratio of choline. An increased ratio of N-acetyl aspartate to choline is indicative of normal brain tissue, whereas a reverse in this could actually uh, signify the presence of a tumor. As seen in this image here, the concentration of choline is greater than that of N-acetyl aspartate. And this corresponds to the boxed off area here, which is where a tumor is residing. Functional MRIs may also be used uh, in this whole process. And what functional MRIs do is they correlate regions of the brain with the functional output that it has on the patient. It detects the fluctuations in blood oxygenation levels across different areas of the brain and then correlates this with a patient who is instructed to perform a particular task. So this may be moving a hand, moving a leg, or in the case of patients with a particular aptitude in, a, in an art form, such as playing the violin, they may be instructed to do so while this functional MRI is running in order to identify the areas that are responsible for this motor output. This data is then mapped over a traditional MRI image, uh, which is then used prior to the tumor resection or radiotherapeutic removal to identify the specific areas of brain tissue that if harmed could cause a significant damage to the patient in terms of their day-to-day -day functionality. An exciting prospect in glioblastoma diagnosis is the implementation of PET scans. Uh, PET scans could, uh, pros uh, could uh, prospectively provide a clearer picture of tumor features and thus allow for a method of non-invasive grading as well as provide a more accurate tumor outline. Uh, the forms of PET scans that could be implemented in early stages of uh, diagnosis of glioblastoma are, um, uh, a couple of examples are 18F FDG PET and 11C MET PET. The prefixes to the word PET are indicative of the tracer being used. Uh, FDG PET is currently used in the diagnosis of a plethora of other cancers, uh, and it accumulates in areas with increased glycolytic metabolism, that is the use of glucose, uh, which is a characteristic uh, prevalent in most malignant tumors. However, it has its limitations in the context of glioblastoma diagnosis because normal brain soft tissue actually has a high glycolytic metabolism since it uses glucose as a primary source of energy. And so this results in a high background noise, attenuating the contrast that we see between the tumor and the background. Hence, using FDG PET in the brain can result in uh, missing early primary as well as recurrent gliomas. And so it is not optimal for the detection of glioblastoma. MedPET, on the other hand, traces the use of the amino acid methionine, which is preferentially used by glioma cells. The uptake of methionine by normal brain tissue is actually quite minimal, and so this navigates around the limitations of FDG PET. However, MedPET has its own drawbacks, and uh, one of them being the increased uptake of MET by the brain is actually indicative of a global increase in amino acid transport across the blood-brain barrier, not a specific up to increased uptake of methionine by the tumor alone. However, the primary setback of MedPET remains to be the short 20-minute half-life of the carbon-11 used in the tracer, and so this hinders tracer accumulation, once again attenuating contrast. So we get back to the same problem that we had with um, FDG PET. The PET tracer that is relevant to the project that I'm doing this year is 18F FET, where fluoride 18 is used. Uh, this is an amino acid tracer just like MedPET, and it consists of a tyrosine analog. 
the fluoride 18 used has a half-life of 109 minutes. And so this circumvents the uh, limitations of both MedPET and uh, FDGPET. Uh, furthermore, the tracer uh, uptake by the tumor is independent of blood-brain barrier activity. And so the data obtained is more specific to the tumor, not just a global increase in amino acid transport. So I guess the next natural question is, why would FedPET work in the first place? And this is because tyrosine, which is in the FedPET tracer, is an integral component of receptor tyrosine kinases, which are found throughout the body. As shown in these set of, um, uh, set, a set of graphics here, the signaling molecule or ligand binds to the receptor, which is found on the surface of cells throughout the body. Uh, after this, the intracellular components, which are heavily consisted of tyrosine, then these monomers uh, bind together and form a dimer, after which these dimers phosphorylate one another. And this triggers a signaling cascade in the cell uh, under the MAPK pathway, which regulates cell division, cell growth, and cell death. An uncontrolled upregulation of receptor tyrosine kinases is an oncogenic factor. And this is in fact seen in other cancers, such as chronic myeloid leukemia, where there is a translocation between the chromosomes 9 and 22, which results in the synthesis of a gene known as the BCR-ABL gene. And this BCR-ABL gene translates overactive receptor tyrosine kinases, which propagates the cancer. The aim of FEDPET is to use a similar mechanism in the diagnosis of glioblastoma. So does FEDPET work? And it has actually been found that approximately 95% of glioblastoma cases exhibit a significantly increased uptake of FEDPET. And what we can also see is that uh, dynamic FEDPET imaging can be used to grade tumors as well. So this, this, is, this can be seen in this image on the right. Uh, the first column are just the MRI images, and these are the regions where the tumor exists. The second column are static FEDPET images, which is essentially the same, which gives a, a very similar output to the MRI image, with the tumors being here and here again. And the last column, these are the dynamic features or, or dynamic FEDPET imaging. And uh, this involves the uh, recording the tracer accumulation pattern over a period of approximately 40 minutes and then correlating this pattern of tracer absorption with the grade of the tumor. So usually uh, a pattern, uh, as seen in the uh, very bottom graph here, uh, a pattern of a sudden increase followed by an eventual decrease over time of tracer, uh, of tracer concentration that is associated with a higher grade glioma, which in this case is a grade four uh, astrocytoma. On the other hand, a more steady increase over time followed by an eventual plateauing is associated with lower grade gliomas. And in this case, this is a grade two one. And uh, furthermore, what we can also see is that static fed pet images have the utility, have a similar utility to MRIs in terms of tumor delineation, because we can see the outline of the tumor. And in fact, it has actually been found that the static fed pet scans are more reliable than MRIs at identifying the metabolically active tumor regions. And this has been done by comparing MRI and fed pet findings with uh, surgical findings, uh, autopsies, as well as biopsies. And so a combination of static and dynamic FET imaging could actually be an effective tool at diagnosis and treatment planning of glioblastoma. The project that I'm doing revolves around a, a particular set of data, and that is the pre and post radiotherapy FET PET scans from 24 patients who were diagnosed with glioblastoma multiforme at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital. Uh, the project is essentially split into three stages, and the first stage involves me extracting features of the glioblastoma tumor regions from the pre and post treatment static fed pet images only, and then using this in, uh, using this information to construct a machine learning model that can predict patient outcomes from just the static image features as well as changes in these features after the treatment. Uh, the next stage shall involve integrating the dynamic fed pet images uh, image features as well and uh, integrating that into the machine learning model alongside with the static image features, uh, as well as the changes in features after treatment. And then uh, time permitting, the final stage uh, shall involve including uh, details of the radiotherapeutic treatment as well. For example, the dosage that was administered and then uh, adding that into the machine learning pro uh, program such that the uh, outcomes of the patient can be correlated with the dynamic, static, as well as dosage features and the changes in features or after treatment. Uh, my main focus thus far has been to learn the basics of Python 
as well as the pyridomics package and develop uh, a comprehensive understanding of the uh, existing literature regarding the subject. Uh, currently, my goal has been to develop uh, code uh, on using the pyridomics package to extract features from FETPET and MRI images, and uh, that's actually just been completed. And so the next stage is to begin analyzing the patient data. And so as part of the first stage, uh, what I will be required to do is to first uh, collect the data for the 24 patients, and that involves the and that includes the pre and post static FedPet images, as well as the uh, tumor volumes and the outcomes for each patient. Uh, the tumor volume shall be extracted via Python, and then the features shall be extracted via pyridomics. Uh, then the features shall be investigated, where they'll be correlated with one another, as well as the outcome of the patient. Then the stability of the features shall be assessed, and the changes shall also be recorded, and then that shall also be correlated with the outcome. Using all of this information, a machine learning model uh, will be produced, uh, and rather than using a training and test set, because of the small sample size of 24 patients, it is likely that I might have to implement something like cross-validation. Uh, uh, and uh, after creating this machine learning model uh, via Python, I would be required to evaluate the model performance and then make the enhancements that are required. Uh, and it's very similar for the uh, second stage of the project as well. Uh, the only difference being that now the dynamic uh, FedPet uh, data would also have to be taken into account and uh, be added uh, into the uh, static feature machine learning model as well. Uh, the only difference be uh, between static and dynamic features being that the dynamic features, more so than just being uh, resembling an MRI image, they consist of the time to peak data for the tumor. And so that would have to be integrated as well into the model. And then the final stage uh, shall be to add the radiotherapeutic features uh, alongside with the static and dynamic features to uh, create the final product of uh, that machine learning model. And uh, if I were to represent it graphically, it looks something like this. So uh, first of all, the static features shall be extracted, analyzed, and then a machine learning model shall be made. Then the dynamic features shall be extracted, analyzed, and alongside with the static features, there's a model that's produced. And then the final stage, uh, the radiotherapy dosage features shall be extracted and then added with the static and dynamic features to create a final machine learning uh, model. And uh, that concludes my presentation. These are the sources from which I obtained information. Thank you very much.